everyone. I am thrilled to welcome you all to the UVM Alumni Association's 2024 George V. Kidder Award and Lecture. Today, we celebrate and honor a deeply respected UVM faculty member, professor of biology in the College of Arts and Sciences, Allison K. Brody. My name is Kathy Tremblay, a proud graduate of UVM's class of 1985, and I am the president of the UVM Alumni Association Board of Directors. It is my privilege to represent the Alumni Association and host this celebratory event. Each year, the UVM Alumni Association confers four signature awards. Three of these celebrate outstanding alumni in our community. And the fourth, the Kidder Award, honors an exceptional member of the faculty for excellence in teaching and for extraordinary contributions to the enrichment of campus life. Established in 1974, this award honors the memory of George V. Kidder, UVM class of 1922 and former Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Dean Kidder served the university for more than 70 years before his passing in 1995. He positively influenced the lives of thousands of students, including generations of living alumni often offering insight and encouragement that had lasting impacts on their lives. The UVM Alumni Association is pleased to present this meaningful award in his honor and recognize our amazing faculty members whose dedication inspires our students. Thank you to all of the past award recipients and to Allison for your extraordinary contributions to UVM. At this time, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce UVM's interim president, Patricia Prelock. Thank you so much, Kathy, and it's so great to see all the, of you who are coming here, and this is a tribute to Allison. Thank you. So it's wonderful to be able to offer to Allison my personal congratulations and join everyone who's celebrating the importance of outstanding teaching and mentoring here at the University of Vermont, of which Allison is a great model. To our audience members, past Kidder Award winners, my academic colleagues, members of the UVM Alumni Association leadership, special guests, and of course, Allison, um, thank you all for being here and celebrating this important award and recognition of what is so important in our scholar-teacher model. Allison is, and not surprising to many of you, a remarkable teacher and mentor who was recommended for this special honor by students, alumni, and her peers. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Zoology from Michigan State University in 1980, a Master's in Behavioral Ecology, Ecology, ecology sorry, in 1984 from the University of Kansas, and a PhD in Entomology from the University of California, Davis in 1991. We are lucky that she found her way to Vermont in 1995, where she is now a professor of biology in the College of Arts and Sciences. Good move, <laughs> Bill. Um, can I give you credit for that? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Yeah. Allison specializes in the ecological and evolutionary consequences of multiple species interactions, and her research seeks to better understand the interactions between plants, pollinators, predispersal seed predators, herbivores, and nectar robbers. Much of her research has been conducted at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory in Colorado and has undoubtedly made a really positive impact on our people and our planet. Thank you for that, Allison. Allison is well known for her dedication to the success of her students and the vibrancy of the entire UVM community. She is the epitome of the scholar teacher and has positively impacted the lives of hundreds of students over her nearly 30 years at our institution. The Alumni Association received an overwhelming response to her nomination for this award. And I want to take a moment just to share some of the things that Allison's students, peers, and alumni wrote about her. 
So one student said this, Dr. Brody's emphasis on teaching applicable skills, her encouragement to be curious about ecological relationships, and her commitment to team building have shaped my college experience and will continue to have an impact on the way I observe and study around the world um, and into the future. One of Allison's former students said this, she remains a source of wisdom and guidance. I am continuously inspired by the person she is, the value that motivates her in both her personal and professional life, and the deep love that she has for the work that she does. She is one of those rare gems in the academic world who leaves her mark far beyond the classroom, the teacher whose actions and words remain an inspirational part of your lifelong narrative. And a colleague offered this observation. Allison exemplifies the qualities we all aspire to have as teachers and mentors. She is kind, she is patient, she is compassionate, she's organized, and she's wicked smart. She is an inspiration to me personally as I see students resurfacing from different corners of the world to express their gratitude to her, the biology department, and to UVM. I can tell that much of their fondness for UVM, even our old building, we're gonna try and do something about that, <laughs> comes from the lifelong friendships that have built um, and have been built with Allison. Allison fosters a love of place and a commitment to excellence that benefits us all tremendously. Allison, your students and colleagues have proclaimed with conviction and deep affection that you are an exceptional mentor and educator. We are privileged that you have chosen to share your gifts with them and with us here at the University of Vermont. We congratulate you on this well-deserved award and all this recognition from your students, your former students, and your peers. For all that you have done and all that you continue to do, we are deeply honored to recognize you as the winner of the 2024 Kidder Award. As a symbol, and we're okay, we have this. Come on up, Allison. As a symbol of our gratitude, allow me to present to you this Simon Pierce clock as a daily reminder <laughs> of the important work that you do on behalf of the University of Vermont. And although I know after the end of this academic year you're leaving us for Colorado, thank you for the contributions you've made to planetary health and understanding the connections between people and planet. And I hope you will continue to collaborate with us even though you're in Colorado. Yes, congratulations. Thank you, President Prelock. Kelly DiDio, the winner of the 2023 George V. Kidder Award is the Executive Director of the School of the Arts, Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and Rush C. Hawkins, Professor of Art History. Unfortunately, Kelly could not be here with us tonight, but she has recorded a video to share her congratulations. Allison, so sorry I can't be there. I'm at a conference, but I wanted to at least send a few words of congratulations on having your hard work and dedication recognized um, by the Kidder Award. I remember, of course, very fondly when I uh, found out about being last year's winner, and we're just so fortunate to be at a university that encourages, supports, and celebrates our achievements and our real commitment to the success of our students and of the university. I wish I could be there to give you the pen. Um, I'm sure I'll see you around soon. And I hope it's a wonderful evening for you to really reflect on um, your career thus far and be surrounded by people that are so thrilled uh, for you and honored to be your colleagues and friends. 
Allison, if you could just join me up front here for a moment. So Kelly is not here to give you your pin, but I would like to do that for her. And all of our winners receive this pin. It says George V. Kidder Outstanding Faculty Award. And I hope that you accept this and wear it with pride. I will do both. Okay, I'll just let you hold it for now. Thanks. And then one other thing, on behalf of the UVM Alumni Association, thank you for your incredible contributions to the University of Vermont. And I would like to present you with this award in this honor. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> I would now like to invite Amy Seidel, graduate class of 2002, co-director and senior lecturer in environmental studies to talk about Allison's impact on students and alumni. Right. Thank you. Oops. Put it up a little bit from my height. <laughs> thank you, and thank you, Kathy. Thank you to everybody who's joined us today. As Allison's former student, colleague, and long-term friend, it is my great pleasure to stand here and celebrate her, her remarkable career as a scholar, teacher, dedicated member of the UVM community, and a steward of the planet. I arrived at UVM as Allison's first graduate student in 1995, but I first met her as a young field biologist 40 years ago. So I'll let you do the math. <laughs> at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, Gothic, Colorado, where Allison has built her research career and become a world expert on pollination systems in mountain environments. At Rumble, which is a shorthand for those of you who may not know, it's what we call the lab, Allison mentored me, plant insect interactions and field ecology, and then I joined her at UVM to pursue my doctorate in the field. Her mentorship and friendship has been a tremendous gift in my life. Not only is Allison's research renowned, fascinating, creative, and complex, but it also stems from a deep stewardship of the mountains and meadows where she has worked for more than 40 years. Her keen ability to observe the small things that run the world fly pollinators, nectar thieves, soil microorganisms, alpine flowers, and the tiniest seeds they produce. So let me just paint a picture for those of you who are not or were not a student of Allison's. The lab bench, thousands of seeds in coin envelopes, microscopes, and all of us counting them <laughs> by the hundreds. <laughs> this work inspired me and many other students to study plant-insect relationships and, as importantly, the ecological and evolutionary theories that can be tested through them. Under Allison's guidance, I learned to see the world, alpine and subalpine habitats in particular, as a place of captivating ecological complexity. And I grew into a scientist who finds, as Allison does, joy an immense wonder in the natural world. As a current colleague and faculty member, I aspire to emulate Allison, to be effective, curious, collegial, creative, and focused on enhancing the student experience. Allison is known by her counterparts as a collaborator, a true colleague, an exemplar of the teacher-scholar model, and someone who puts students first. I frequently hear from our shared students, biology, environmental studies, etc., cetera, um, how exciting her research is. And, and just in addition to all of this work in the Rockies, Allison began programs in Kenya and in Vermont. 
and how they as students are more critical, more aware of the critical role that insects and pollinators play in ecosystem and planetary health. As she has done for me, Allison nurtures their enthusiasm, supports their trajectory as investigators, and fosters a shared and mutual love for the natural world. Being Allison's student, colleague, and friend has done nothing less than shape my life. As I mentioned, Allison and I have known one another for 40 years. I met her when I was 20. And for the last 15, we've been colleagues at the University of Vermont. It has been our tradition to also walk with one another. Walks, hikes really, that began with 14,000 foot peaks in the West Elk Range of Colorado and include standing Thursday mornings here in Camel's Hump State Park in Vermont. Today is Thursday. And Allison and I met this morning and walked a known route, one that takes us up a steep incline, sometimes she has me talk during that time, and breaks out into views of Mansfield and Camel's Hump, and today the sublime peak of fall colors. Like Darwin, these walks have been our thinking paths, where we cover everything from new research ideas to novel teaching approaches to family matters, and of course, to plants, insects, and birds. Usually there's a dog or two with us. Walking has been a way for us to reflect on our career, the one we both chose, the lives we've lived, and the paths we've taken. Allison is onto a new set of paths one will walk to, no doubt, and I look forward to seeing how they are illuminated by your brilliance. Congratulations, Allison, and thank you. I am honored to be among the many who are celebrating you today. Now, without further ado, I wish to welcome my dear friend, colleague, walking and thinking companion, Allison K. Brody. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> well, <clears throat> to the right, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you for your comments. I'm fairly speechless, actually. <laughs> um, those of you who know me know that all talks should always begin with acknowledgments. So that's where I'll start. I want to first start thanking Brian Balliff, who nominated me for this award and has served as the chair of biology for the last three years. Sarah Helms Cahan, very close colleague and friend, our wonderful chair prior to Brian. Jim Vigoro, our previous chair who always had my back at this institution and was the chair of my department for quite a number of my years here. And prior to that, Judy Van Houten, and Laura Newman, who I always call um, administrative assistant extraordinaire, because without her, like the whole entire biological science pro program wouldn't run. Um, so she was, she's been f a phenomenal help. And then, of course, I need to acknowledge funding agencies that have kept this research program going for many, many years. And thanks to the Alumni Association for this award and for your kind words and and doing the things that you do for UVM. I also want to thank Amy Seidel <laughs> for, and others. Um, Hope Curry, uh, you all know Amy on the left, and Hope Curry on the right, who I know are at least two of the people who wrote letters for me in support of a, this award. So I've been thinking about this talk for a long time, and honestly, I felt like a blank slate. Like, what am I going to get up here and say, and how do I encapsulate my experience at UVM? And 
the various people that I've interacted with and who've enriched my life in this path. And I was really struggling. And I've told my students that in a, in a 20 to 30 minute talk, you've only got one message, right? How do I do that? You know, how do I make that message whole? And um, I am a great fan of a woman named Suleika Jawad. Some of you may know Suleika, know of her work. Suleika wrote a book um, called Between Two Kingdoms. And she was a, a publicist and a, a contributor to the New York Times for a piece called Life Interrupted. She contracted leukemia in her 20s. And that's what her book is about, being a young person struggling with a life-threatening disease. And she now has a Sunday newsletter that's called um, The Isolation Journals, which I read religiously on Sundays. And so it was a few weeks ago, and I'm struggling thinking about this talk. And I read The Isolation Journals that day. And she had a guest editor. That dress, guest editor, Drew McGee, was talking about people asking important questions. And from Martin Luther King, who wrote, Life's most persistent question and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And Mary Oliver, tell me, what, it is it, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And Drew McGee was a PhD student at the time, and he had weekly meetings with his mentor. He was, he was getting his PhD in child psychology, and his mentor said, that her young six-year-old son started asking people, what is a question that you asked that changed your life? And my mind went from a blank slate to bingo. <laughs> I know what I'm going to talk about today. And what I thought I would tell you in the next, hopefully, 20 minutes or so is the, about the question that changed my life and set me on the trajectory that others have spoken about today. So this starts at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, um, where I've worked for since 1981. And I'll also let you do that math. Um, I, as a high school student and a college student, thought I was either going to go into veterinary medicine or I was going to study animal behavior. And I decided as a college student that I was going to study animal behavior for various reasons well, we may get to at the end of this talk. And I started at the University of Kansas with the intention of doing a PhD. At that time, nature nurture was a big question. How much of our behavior is about nature and how much of it is about nurture? And so I was enrolled in a PhD program studying yellow-bellied marmots. Yellow-bellied marmots are the Western equivalent of our Eastern woodchuck. They live socially in groups. Our Eastern woodchuck is solitary. And they show what is called kin-biased behavior, where kin are treated preferentially. And I thought, um, is how much of that is nature and how much of that is nurture? And I'm going to study this for my PhD. I got a little bit disillusioned with studying marmots because it's difficult. IACOC, this is before IACOC rules, but it's still difficult to manipulate mammals and expect them to do anything that's normal behavior. So I was walking along the trail one day. Um, much like this trail, thinking about things. And I smelled something that smelled really skunky. And I was like, Ugh, what is that terrible smell? And I looked down to see this plant. And this is Heraclium linatum, or cow parsnip. And it's difficult to see, probably from far back. But it's covered in flies. I didn't know anything about pollination biology. I did not know that flies could be pollinators. But I thought, this is bizarre. Like, here is this plant clearly advertising itself for pollinators using these big showy flowers and this strong smell. And if you watch a fly, you can see its tongue coming out of its mouth. And it was gathering, these flies were eating pollen. And that brought me to the question that changed my life. And that question was, what are the trade-offs that plants make with cues that might be used, that they're using to attract animals, that could also be used by enemies. We generally think of showy traits and sweet smells and, and you know, red or showy flowers, um, lots of pollen, lots of nectar, as attracting pollinators. And we think about this coevolutionary process between plants and pollinators. And indeed, 
that's a very that's strong, very strong selection on floral traits. Pollinators exert very strong selection on floral traits. But there's a lot more to this story than just that interaction between a plant and its pollinator. So if we look at variation, whether we're interested in the variation in the upper left and domesticated dogs that we have selected for patterns of variation, or in the bottom right, which is a whole group of orchids of the same species where variation occurs, we can wonder how that variation and why that variation exists. So I guess, and I always say to my students, and you'll see this in the end of the talk, like, what's your hook? Why is this question that you're asking important? And for me, we can ask a question about the mean, what's that strong selection exerted by pollinators, or the variance? And I guess I'm just a person who's more interested in the variance than the mean. So coming back to this question and this puzzle that I've been trying to piece together for my entire career as a scientist, I'm interested in how multi-species affect the interactions between pollinators, the floral traits, and plant fitness. And if you, this is a, this is a busy slide. Red is negative, just like if your bank account's in the red, and black is positive. So how do antagonists impose um, variation in the link between pollinators, floral traits, and plant fitness. I've done my work with two species of plants, Polymonium foliosissimum on the left-hand side. It doesn't have a good uh, common name. It's just called sticky polymonium. We have a congener in, the, in Vermont that's called Jacob's Ladder. Some of you might know it. And then scarlet gilia on the right, Ipomopsis aggregata. Polymonium is pollinated primarily by bumblebees. Scarlet gilia is pollinated primarily by hummingbirds. But they share a very common predispersal seed predator. And by predispersal, that means an animal that eats the seeds before they leave the parent plant, thus predispersal, prior to the seeds being dispersed. This is a small fly that sticks its abdomen underneath the sepal and oviposits an egg. The larva hatches and eats the developing seeds. And here is an egg on each of those plants underneath the sepal. They also share vertebrate herbivores like this deer. And Ipomopsis is nectar robbed by, this is Bombus occidentalis, which I think of as the Darth Vader of the bumblebee world. It looks like a very sinister bumblebee. And it's, its tongue is too short to get in the flower legitimately, so it chews a hole in the side and it steals the nectar from the flower. So I've been trying, and I have had lots of help in this, um, to put these pieces of this puzzle together. And this first piece, looking at the effects of herbivores, predispersal seed predators, nectar robbers, and um, <clears throat> on floral traits and plant fitness, has been been a long-term collaboration with my second graduate student, PhD student here at the University of Vermont, a woman named Becky Irwin, who went off and is still very, having a very successful career. She went from here to Georgia to Dartmouth and is now at University of South Carolina. Uh, no, she's at NC State, excuse me. So that's, that sort of encompasses the big questions of the first, I don't know, 15 years of my career, and I'll come back to them as well. And then it was 2001, which wasn't 15 years later. It was only since I got to here, 1995. This is only six years later. I was on my first sabbatical, and I always wanted to travel to East Africa, but I didn't want to do it as a tourist. And I had a collaborator, who I, a man named Todd Palmer, who I had was working at, at a place called uh, Impala Research Center outside of Nanuki, which is shown in, with the big red arrow. And so off I went on my first sabbatical to this research center, not too shabby, out in the bush. And this is just quintessential savanna grasslands, where you have Acacia drepanolobium, which is called the whistling thorn acacia, in the, as the only overstory tree, and then grasses underneath. And this is just a, a few views as I head out to the field site. Um, does anybody 
Want to take a guess what this what these gazelles are? How did you know? Who said that? Oh no, Heidi. None of my former students are supposed to answer this question. <laughs> How do you know? Because he's always taught me that grants have pants. Grants have pants. <laughs> the, the rump patch on a grant gazelle goes up over the hip, whereas on a Thompson's gazelle, many people would look at this and think this is Thompson's gazelle. Thank you, Heidi. She remembered. Great. So headed into the field we are, <clears throat> and just a few views on the way to the field sites. And I felt like a beginning graduate student. Here I was on sabbatical. I didn't have a project in mind when I went to <coughs> Kenya. What can I study? And one of the things that hit me over the head was termite mounds. Like, what? That picture doesn't look like a termite mound. These are not mounds that we think of when we think of termite mounds, but you know, big columnar mounds that cheetahs sit on top of. But what is in the foreground of this mound, I mean of this slide, is a termite mound. So what is green in the picture um, is a mound, and then as you move further back, you're off mound. These mounds can be very large, so they can be 10 to 20 meters in diameter and a half a meter high. Completely vegetated, although you often know you're on a termite mound because there's diggings from aardvark and aardwolves that are trying to get to the termites underneath the mound. Um, and they're treeless. They are very common and regular in this environment. So this is a satellite picture. So everything that's red in the, in the photograph, it's, it's a satellite picture taken in infrared. So what's red in the photograph is green on the ground. And so all of those little dots, except for the bigger circles, those are boma sites. And boma is a noun and a verb. It, you, you boma your cattle, right? Um, areas where cattle are corralled. But barring those, all of those little dots in this photo are termite mounds. So I, along with colleagues, got interested in how the termites affect biological diversity by creating heterogeneous habitat that would be not heterogeneous, it would be very homogeneous if the termites weren't there and everything was the same. So yet another puzzle that we spent years trying to figure out, and that is how do termites, by the termites are decomposers, they're taking dead plant material and turning that into nutrients, along with the fungi that live in their mounds and turning that into nutrients that feeds plants, enhances soil um, nutritive value to plants. Vertebrate herbivores love those grasses growing on termite mounds, and they're inputting nutrients into the soil as well through dung and urine deposition. And so we were intrigued by how the activities of termites and the acti activities of vertebrate herbivores create this heterogeneous habitat that thus supports greater biological diversity than would be there if these organisms were not there. I was accompanied, accompanied into the field by a graduate student, Renee Pettipaw, who has recently joined the faculty in plant biology here at UVM. She's holding the big five, ah, the big five grasses in this case. And Renee got interested in looking at the effects of termite mounds and their nutritive properties on the interactions between plants and mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi are fungi that associate with plants in their roots, and they exchange photosynthetic carbon that the plant produces in exchange for recalcitrant or difficult to extract nutrients from the soil to the plant. So the plant's getting the nutrients from the fungi, and the fungi is getting carbon from the plants. But if you have highly nutritive soils because of the activities of termites, how does that thus change the interactions between plants and the my mycorrhizal fungi? So that is what Renee contributed to the project. So adding the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi component to this puzzle as well. I came back to UVM. Oh, first I went, you know, here I am splitting my, splitting, I did come back to UVM. But I was splitting my time between Kenya and Colorado. Don't do that. 
it's crazy making. But I was, and had also rec had recruited other students into my lab, Gretel Clark, who did a PhD with me, and John Gonzalez, um, who did his accelerated master's program with me. And given Renee's um, contribution and recent interest in linking these above and below ground interactions, we started looking at the effects of mycorrhizal fungi on the plants that I had been study studying in Colorado prior um, to heading off to Kenya. There's a new twist in this title, which is looking at plant sex, pollinators, and resistance to herbivores. What is different between the flower on the left and the flowers on the right? Yes, size, absolutely. What else? Yes, thank you. Yellow. The yellow is pollen. The flower on the left um, is a female flower. These plants are, the fancy name is gynodioecious. So they have, plant, they have flowers that are, the anthers are rudimentary and don't produce pollen. Flower on the left is female. Flower on the right is their typical hermaphrodite producing pollen. That's the male gamete and seeds once fertilized. Um, the female gamete. So how females persist in populations has been a puzzle even since Darwin because they've given up their male contribution to fitness. They don't sire seeds. So <clears throat> we were interested in, again, this suite of interactions that I've introduced you to already and adding mycorrhizal fungi to this puzzle to try to figure out how females persist in gynodioecious populations of Polymonium foliosissimum or sticky Polymonium. So I was here and giving a talk at the Gund on these above and below ground interactions. And just before I left my office to go over to the Gund to talk about this, a man, uh, the phone rang and I answered the phone and it was this man who's Ben Waterman and is a blueberry farmer in Vermont. And lo and behold, Ben had already been st starting to look at these below and above ground effects of my mycorrhizal fungi on his blue, well, they're called ericoids, but we don't have to go into those details. Mycorrhizal fungi on his blueberry farm and out in Johnson, Vermont. And if you haven't been there, you must go. And he produces the best blueberries in Vermont, bar none, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so he and Mark Steritz, another faculty member, a faculty member in uh, plant and soil science, had inoculated and not inoculated half of 1,000 plants. 500 were inoculated and 500 were not um, on Ben's farm out in Johnson. I was very fortunate to collaborate with Jean Harris and Taylor Ricketts on a project with Ben. We, were, we garnered NSF funding to look at how inoculation alters floral traits and alters plant interactions with pollinators and yield right here in Vermont in high bullish blueberry. So what's the puzzle here? And the puzzle here is, as I just told you a few minutes ago, mycorrhizal fungi are feeding their plants nutrients. Do, the question is, do plants then take those extra nutrients, put them in, invest them in floral resources like nectar and pollen that would enhance their attractiveness to pollinators and thus increase their yield in high bush blueberry? And those questions are very well um, depicted here in a proposed path of the effects that was drawn by a, a former honors undergraduate student with me, Gretchen Davis Savison. So mycorrhizae feeding into floral rewards, pollinator behavior, and yield. We had lots of help on this project and um, really great minds of students like Erin O'Neill, who is in the room somewhere, who did her master's work on looking at these effects in early in the season, looking at the effects of grow or early in establishment, the effects of inoculating plants with um, mycorrhizal fungi and looking at their impact on growth and reproduction. And Lainey Williams, who added in a component of, fer of adding fertilizer to plants and asking if there are trade-offs then fertilizing plants with 
input with what, commercial fertilizer versus inoculating plants with mycorrhizal fungi. And a whole suite of undergraduate students, many of whom, or several of whom did their honors projects with me, looking at various aspects of this, of this project and big question. So, take a breather here, and only to say that I have always, um, oh, before I got there, sorry, I just, I had to throw this in. You can't buy happiness, but you can buy blueberries, and that's about the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I've always had the philosophy that students can work with me on whatever they want to work with, as long as I can do a good job advising them and mentoring them, they don't have to work on the systems that I work on. And my life as a scientist and as, an, as a mentor, as a teacher, has been tremendously enriched by the students who not only have joined me on projects that I was already thinking about and they contributed their ideas, but also the students who said, you know, we're interested in something slightly different. And I want to really acknowledge and thank them as well for enriching my life as a scientist and a teacher and a mentor. Amy Seidel was the first of these. And although we met at Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, she went off to high, literally higher peaks. She worked on a peak, that, a 14,000 foot peak, and had to hike up from her cabin to 13,000 feet every single day where she worked and studied the butterfly oviposition preference and larval performance in, under global change conditions. And Sarah Whitman, who did a postdoc with me in Kenya and looked at the effects of extra floral nectar and protein on ant defense of their host trees. They live on these acacia trees and defend them from herbivores. And Laura Hill, who worked here in Vermont, as I said, there's a congener of the plant that I worked on, Jacob's Ladder, and Laura worked on a congener of that, um, Polymonium van Bruntii, which is a rare plant and asking questions about rarity in that species and what are the causes and what are the consequences. And as you, many of you in this room know, those three individuals are highly valued faculty at UVM today. Um, we also had great help in the field. These are two of our field assistants. Ursula Lang is not here, and, but Heidi Albright is. And I convinced Heidi, after being such a phenomenal person to work with in the field, to do a master's project with me. She wanted to stay in Vermont, and she worked on um, defense versus growth trade-offs in Arabidopsis thaliana, which is the lab sort of rat of the plant world, <laughs> if that makes any sense, but yeah. <laughs> um, I had a really wonderful PhD student, Nabil Nasseri, who initially wanted to come to Kenya and work on elephant-human interaction, but wasn't able to procure funding for that, and instead studied um, the effects. I know he went from elephants to ants. But he studied the effects of ants that tend um, a, a insect, it's called a membracid, that is extracting nutrients out of plants and then feeding, it, feeding the exudate to their ant uh, bodyguards. And he looked at that, uh, those effects of those species interactions on their host trees called honey mesquite in Texas. And my most recent um, PhD students, Samantha Alger, who's in the room, um, who got really interested in looking at bee diseases. I don't do molecular work, and so S Samantha did this completely independently from me, and looking at the transmission rates and the means of transmission of RNA viruses among bumblebees and honeybees in, here in Vermont. And then Alex Burnham, who took a, both a field approach and a modeling approach to looking at bee diseases, co-infection, and uh, published a wonderful paper called um, Dirty, title of which Alex is in the room, so he can correct me on this, but Dirty Doorknobs is in, the, is in the title, and you can imagine what that means, right, in our world of, of disease. 
And last but certainly not least, Jessica Cole, who is interested in plants uptaking, the potential for plants to uptake ne things like neonicotinoids neonicotinoid, and express them in nectar and pollen and, their, and, and those effects on uh, bees that might visit those plants. So this is a drawing that Nabil um, put on the whiteboard in my office. And I think it does a great, and it was up there for years, and it has landed in probably every talk I've given since, um, <clears throat> that depicts sort of my, my approach and, and what I always ask my, question, ask my students is A, first of all, to be passionate about whatever it is that you decide to do for your work. And B, I always want to know what's the importance or what's the hook. Right? So there I am asking, what's, what's your hook with my cup of coffee? And a former dog who was, had terrible anxiety, that's the one in the middle that's like, Allison, where is she? Um, right? um, in room 205, Martial Life Science, where we've spent a lot of time. So in wrapping this up, I'm going to have to put on my glasses and read my notes at this point. Um, the question of, or the title of this talk was Finding Awe as a Field Biologist. So what is awe? And I looked this up. The Oxford English Dictionary says awe is a feeling of reverential respect infused with wonder. And I feel that for the natural world in looking at this incredible meadow of wildflowers, or even looking in a managed uh, garden, backyard garden in Vermont, I feel that respect with wonder. But I also feel it towards all of the students that I have ever interacted, not ever interacted with, but many of the students who I've interacted with on an intimate basis in my lab or as in teaching them. I feel that awe, and I feel like my life has been extraordinarily enriched by the opportunity, and I really do see that as an opportunity, to be their teacher and be their mentor. And I've gained as much from them as they, I hope, have gained from me. And I thank you for this award. Congratulations, Allison. We are in awe of you. <laughs> I hope that this event has inspired everyone to reflect on the impact that our talented and dedicated faculty members have on our university community. We look forward to continuing the tradition of celebrating outstanding teaching at UVM. And this will now conclude our formal program, and we ask that you join us for a reception outside of the room right here. Thank you for coming tonight, and congratulations again, Allison.